also if you want to understand today you have to search yesterday i am so pleased to be welcoming you all to our annual academic fest mazi august club but we are in so happy to be seeing everyone in an online mode but nonetheless it is our honor to have with us retired professor radhika singha to deliver her lecture on international pedagogy and in the indian jail committee 1990 to 1920 to modern to american to expensive ma'am is a retired professor of modern history at jawaharlal nehru university her research interests focus on the social history <coughs> of crime and criminality criminal law governmentality borders and border crossing some of her seminal publications include a despotism of law crime and criminal justice in colonial india 1998 passport ticket and india rubber stamp the problem of the pauper pilgrim in colonial india and her most recent publication is the police war indian labor in global conflict 1914 to 1921 which was published in 2020 Before handing over the floor to ma'am, I would request everyone to switch on their cameras if possible. Also, kindly keep yourself muted in the duration of the talk. Should I start now, Anushka? Yes. Right. Over to you. Thank you. Right. So I begin by thanking Shamla Sima, Biomika, Vimansa, Dr. Pankaj Chha, Dr. Priyanka Sharma, and my introducer Anushka. as well as other students and faculty of the history department at LSR uh the conference outline was so incisive and clearly set out that it made me look forward very much to being part of this event i apologize profusely to my co-presenters for not being there for their presentations that was because of bad time management which kept me busy on my powerpoint till the last moment um So what I'm going to talk on today uh is the Indian Jail Committee report of 1919 to 1920 uh it was a massive uh, report with four appendices and the interesting thing is that um it is universally acknowledged in India as a sort of milestone as a milestone when uh, the objective of uh, deterrence gave way to the objective of reform and rehabilitation uh even today you find that the commonwealth human rights initiative in india when it is asking for certain reforms like allowing visitors more freely into prisons uh etc it actually still cites the 1919 to 20 jail report but Uh, even as you know uh, even as uh, various kind of institutions etc acknowledge the pioneering role of the indian jail committee uh, this tribute is almost immediately followed by the admission that very little actually changed on the ground and almost almost at the very moment that it was being formulated there were voices official voices in india which said that it was too advanced for a backward colony it was too american because the committee had been to america and that it was much too expensive now another reason which began to be given for its non implementation and it's faithfully reproduced in <laughs> every uh, wikipedia entry is that in the 1920 soon after you had the montague kelsford reforms and you had a system of diarchy so jails became one of those subjects which passed to the provincial ministries in which you now had a representative element so the colonial state was basically saying that once responsibility for jails became decentralized the basically the indian element now in the legislative councils they weren't very interested in penal reform they were more interested in the transfer of political power now that is not in fact the case that nothing was done uh, but certainly uh, the ambitiousness of the exercise is something which uh, prompts us to take a close look at it 
So now I go to my PowerPoint presentation, and if for some reason you want me to stop, uh, show me. Don't hesitate, or if I'm not coming across clearly, don't hesitate to stop. Is it okay? Can everybody see the full screen? Yes. Okay, fine. So, uh, what what is of interest to us uh, in this jail committee report? Now, there's a lot of work which has been done on colonial prisons, particularly for the period up to the 1870s, and it's been pointed out that uh, the colonial penal regime was characterized by the continued use of corporal violence, capital punishment, but that there was also an interest in exploring new disciplinary forms. For example, the setting up of central jails like this one at Rampur in 1911, uh, the use of dietary, medical and sanitary routines, everyday parades, like for everything you had to get into a line, for example here in Rangoon jail to get your breakfast. And from the 1870s what we see is that the penal regime cannot be understood only at sites like the jail. We have to see also from the 1870s you had policing in society. That is the targeting of certain so-called deviant communities, whether these were criminal tribes, uh, in, uh, communities held to practice female infanticide, eunuch bands, that is hijra bands, diseased prostitutes suspected of being diseased, etc. So you also had sites of restriction in society. Now, uh, very quickly I want to explain uh, to you the kind of shifts which were taking place in the understanding about the causes of crime by the late 19th century. This is rather schematic, but it will do. Now, uh, according to classical legal theory, the individual was responsible for his or her actions. So to prevent crime, the person had to know exactly what punishment he or she would get for a particular crime. That punishment had to be fixed and it had to be calculable and it had to be equal. So an equal and proportionate measure of punishment for every crime. Now, by the late 19th century, you had the emergence of what is known as positivist criminology, and with it claims to have claims to be formulating a so-called scientific approach to penal practice. Now, it is this, it is from this period that uh, people began to accept that the roots of crime lay not only in the individual and in the individual's choice to commit a criminal act, but it lay in social and environmental factors. I think all of us would now accept, still accept this explanation. You also had biomedical explanations being put forward for criminality. For example, having either a low IQ or you know having something wrong with your psychology that is certain biomedical explanations were put forward these were not always uh, accepted uh, to the same degree these were the subject of considerable debate but the argument was that the human sciences that is sociology statistics medicine could grasp these underlying causes of crime and related to this, the argument was that punishment had to be shaped to the criminal also, not just to the crime. In other words, the objective now was to make the offender, crime was an anti-social act. What you had to do was to socialize the offender again and make him or her fit to enter, re-enter society. The objective, therefore, was reform and rehabilitation, not retribution, which meant that you had to assess the prisoner for reformability or irreformability, or to use a better word, incorrigibility. So for the reformable, which could mean children, 
or first offenders or very petty offenders, what were recommended were non-jail options like a fine or warning or release on probation. What was also recommended was uh, for prisoners who showed that they were reforming, uh, what was recommended was progressive confinement. That is, you had a stage-by-stage prog- uh, stage relaxation of discipline. Some of you must have read about prison farms in India. There's a prison farm somewhere in Pune and they are virtually kind of they're encouraged, they're given freer access to their families, they're allowed greater freedom of movement, etc. These are prisoners who are on the verge of being released. And thirdly, flexible sentences. That is, instead of saying as earlier that once the judge had set the sentence, it ought to be fixed. The argument was that after some time, prisoners' cases should come up for review and those who were very persistent or hardened, they could be kept on and those who were showing signs of reform, they could be permitted an earlier release, perhaps under probationary surveillance or under some form of license. On the other hand, however, you also had the other side, the darker side of criminology and scientific criminology. The argument that for those who had been classed as habituals or as dangerous or the mentally defective, the sentence therefore could be longer. Firstly, to protect society in order to incapacitate the dangerous and the habitual, but also consignment to special institutions to protect and treat the so-called mentally defective. So what you have here is the dangerous idea that the length of your imprisonment did not have to depend on the crime itself, but on the kind of potential for dangerousness that you had. And this is a tendency we see these days in the nature of preventive detention. It's not so much what you have done, but your potential for doing something, your possible dangerousness. And historians have pointed out that so-called scientific penology often resulted in longer rather than shorter periods of imprisonment. Now, these were issues which were being debated both at the national level and at the transnational level. Uh, for example, there might be an acceptance of the principle that flexible sentencing or indeterminate sentencing was a good thing, but the way in which it actually translated into practice obviously depended upon national particularities and different balances of power between the executive, the judiciary and the legislature. Now, what we notice is, uh, you know, not much work has been done on this particular moment. What was the engagement of the colonial uh, of, uh, of, col- of the colonial regime with these new currents of criminology and scientific penology? Now, one shift is certainly that the criminality of so-called criminal tribes began to be explained not only to their religious beliefs or their caste-based trades, but economic disruption, the closure of certain forms of livelihood, for example, the pack trading uh, business due to modern roads and railways, began to be factored in as one of the explanations for their persistence in crime. From the late 19th century, some colonial officials also began to say that it was the exclusiveness of caste Hindu society uh, which kept these individual, uh, these kind of communities at the margins of respectable society. The second important feature is that in India, the medical men in particular wanted to be in the flow of international debates about criminology and penology they felt the Indian Medical Service men served in both civil and military uh, capacities. They contributed to scholarly journals, 
they said that they uh, were familiar with different races and ethnicities and classes therefore they felt that they had a claim to expertise also and wish to voice that claim in these international debates thirdly colonies were as you know important science uh, sites for the emergence of forensic science that is new technologies for being able to detect previous convictions via for example the fingerprint or via for example bodily measurements put on to a car so it wasn't as though you know it was a more um, it was a most dispersed kind of engagement uh, and according to one criminologist mark brown he says that this engagement actually emerged in the 1920s he says what you had was a very uneasy coexistence of theoretical bookish kind of engagements with administrative accounts which were strongly grounded in everyday work so he says what we understand about south asian criminology has to be picked out from a variety of writings practices and thinking about crime now certainly this is generally the case we have to sort of pick up a sense of what was changing from a variety of different kind of uh, documents practices aligned here and there however there is one exception and thankfully for me mark brown uh, sort of uh, did not engage with it leaving me a topic which i could deal with and what is clear is that the indian jail committee report is one of those uniquely self conscious moments in the colonial regime's engagement with international penology here's a copy of this Uh, sorry here's a copy of this report now as i pointed out in the uh, uh, beginning of my talk in all narratives of prison history in india it is said to be the first time that reform rather than deterrence or retribution was defined as the objective now the question i'm asking here is in 1990 if you remember what was happening in april 1919 when the committee was finally appointed you'd had the uh, rowlett act that is the attempt to continue with war time ordinances for preventive detention without trial then you had the movement against the rowlett act which was followed by the massacre at jallianwala bagh and the imposition of martial law in punjab you had a situation of near famine in many parts of india in addition over 1918 to 1919 millions had died from the uh, from the influenza epidemic the end of the war did not mean financial relief you had four post war deficit budgets which meant that fiscal retrenchment cutting back costs was the order of the day so why did a cash strapped government besieged by political unrest sponsor a globe trotting study tour now this was a committee which was a very conservatively constituted committee mostly british officials two with some claims to medical expertise in the sense that they were medical men who had had a long career as superintendents of central jails the two non indians were actually administ no hardly non officials they were administrators themselves one was uh, but from the princely states one was from the uh, sort of the finance minister in the princely state of patiala and one was from the princely state of pudukottai he was a uh, chief minister and he was also the younger brother of the maharaja of that state so why did this very conservative community actually return to start enthusiasm uh, enthusiastically talking about indeterminate or flexible sentencing even though this was a principle which was faltering in the united kingdom that is in england and of course the major question why did it come to be accepted as a reference point for scientific penology even though very little changed 
Now, one argument which has been made in an excellent book by Durba Ghosh, for example, is that the jail committee was a response to the outcry in India about the torments inflicted on political prisoners, especially those transported to the Andaman Islands. Now, transportation had been abolished in England by the 1850s, so the question was, why had this archaic form of punishment been retained for India? And the Andamans were described as a hellhole lost in time and space. So Durba Ghosh's argument in a book called The Gentlemanly Terrorist is that to win support for the post-war constitutional scheme, that is the montague Kelsford reforms, the government had to address these criticisms. And she argues that in the process, political prisoner emerged as a, as a recognized category. But when you actually look at the report, references to political prisoners who were not referred to as political prisoners but as prisoners of wealth or prisoners of social rank are really of the blink and you miss them variety. The report dealt with them in a, just a few paragraphs. It said that if you had a political motive, it did not make the crime any the less uh, terrible. However, there was a concession, as Ujwal Kumar Singh's work points out, the committee made a concession to this criticism, not by accepting the category of political prisoner, but by arguing that prisoners who were of uh, a different kind of social status or who were educated, their bodies were not used to labor, and therefore, on medical grounds, the medical officer might give them concessions in terms of lighter labor, better food, and better clothes. So if then, if this was not the issue which motivated the Indian Jail Committee, what were the reasons why it was set up at all? Now, what we have to remember is going back to 1914, actually it was a resolution passed just before the war in February 1914, a resolution passed in the Imperial Legislative Assembly, which the government had accepted. Now, this resolution was passed by a figure called Rama, uh, uh, Rama Rayaningar. And he asked for an All India Jail Committee uh, to suggest improvements in the light of the experience of the West. Now, Rama Rayaningar, whose statue is in a park in Chennai, uh, is to be found in a park in Chennai, he was a representative from the Loyalist South Indian Landholders Association. But he also patronized a Madras Dravidian Association demanding better representation for non Brahmins in elected bodies and in government service. Now, these uh, Raman, uh, uh, Rama Rangar belonged to a very influential, rich, he was not a Brahmin, but he was a very prosperous Telugu landholder. And non-Brahmin, of course, is not is a very wide caste spectrum. And as you know, non-Brahmin is not so much a social reality as a political constituency which was being forged from the late 19th century. It starts in Western India and takes a hold in the Madras Presidency as well. Now, in order to keep this political constituency together, men like Raya Ningar also had to think of the so-called untouchables and criminal tribes at the bottom of this caste spectrum. And because they spoke of, you know, because uh, this was a voice of an in opposition to the Congress, the Madras government was sympathetic to them. That doesn't mean that I'm saying the non-Brahmin movement was a kind of, they were kind of um, kowtowing to imperialism or something. I'm just saying that from this period, what we see that in the political sphere, you have a variety of different publics emerging. You have a non-Brahmin constituency emerging, you have associations for the depressed classes, you have labor platforms emerging, you have, for example, in Ranchi, certain associations for the more educated members of tribal communities emerging. And in, this, in these multiplicity of voices, 
the government found reason to contest Congress's claim to speak for the nation. Now, what is interesting is that Brian Ingar, in asking for an All India Jail Committee, made no reference whatsoever to political prisoners or to their mistreatment. He took a very sociological view of crime. And I am speculating that because he cited two American newspapers, the Chicago Tribune and one other, I am uh, suspecting that he was familiar with progressivist views on the causes of crime, progressivist views from America. Now, what he said was that destitution, idleness, intemperance, fanaticism, and a host of other circumstances gave rise to crime. In other words, it did not lie only in the individual. These problems would have to be addressed. The civilized world, he said, had witnessed a revolution in ideas regarding punishment. The aim was not retribution, but the humanization of the criminal. He said American prisons were being turned into institutions for rehabilitation. In England, reform was in the air. So he asked for a prison uh, committee to investigate new developments very clearly in the light of the experience of the West. He had no hesitation about asking for that to be the model. Now, what is interesting is that the congressman also spoke up at that time. And you might expect that being a congressman, this Acharya would speak up for the political prisoners. Now, interestingly, he spoke specifically about the Andamans, but he did not refer to the political prisoners there. Now, the political prisoners there were just 300 out of a convict body of 5,000 or a convict body of about 12,000 if you take those who from being convicts had been allowed to settle down in the Andamans. Now, Acharya focused on the convict settler villages. Now, political prisoners did not figure in these settler villages because they were kept confined to the cellular jail there. They were not allowed to transit to settler status. So, Raghav Acharya was, focusing, was not focusing on the political prisoners. Now, what he did was he launched into a blistering moral and eugenic critique of this whole concept of convict settlement in the Andamans. He said that because there were very few female convicts and as compared to the male settler convicts, the sex ratio was skewed. This led to sexual immorality. Convict marriages were illegal relationships. The children, he said, were idiots and imbeciles. And the moral guardrails of caste and religious distinction were totally absent. So what he was saying was that convict settlement was a failure and it held no potential for reform. Now, it's interesting. It took me some time to realize this. But what uh, eventually what I realized was that one shift which did take place was that now respectable Indians were claiming the right to... Uh, enter spaces such as jails, criminal tribe settlements, bostels, etc. and to uh, engage in moral and religious instruction at these sites. Now in colonial India, there was institutional provision for religious instruction for Christian prison prisoners, whether Indians or Europeans, but out of fear of sort of stirring up controversy or catering to all the different castes and religions which might be there in jails, the colonial government had allowed some sort of, uh, you know, activity by the prisoners themselves, but there was no institutional provision. Now Indians were asking for this institutional provision, and the shift is that government was now receptive, provided that instruction was given in an apolitical form. Now, what is very interesting is that my argument is that. Uh, contrary to Durba, who says it was a response to the criticisms about the torments in inflicted on political prisoners, my argument is that the Indian Jail Committee was an effort to change the conversation. So when the whole member accepted this re uh, resolution, he did not refer to his own investigation into a strike by seditionous prisoners in the Andamans. He acknowledged the agenda of penal modernity. He said, yes, the treatment of the confirmed criminal and the moral degenerate, that is the irreformable, 
had to differ from those who were reformable, and he agreed that this jail committee could inquire into convict marriages. Now, in its own narrative, the Indian Jail Committee referred only in passing to recent events in the Andaman Islands. What it underlined was the lapse of time since the last All India Jail Inquiry. Britain was taking new legal initiatives, penal reform was debated at international conferences. So what government was concerned about, it said, was not, you know, it didn't say that government could be reproached for not, for the treatment of political prisoners. It said that government wanted to make sure that it was not reproached for failing to keep pace with modern ideas. So what it did was that it argued that the concern with political prisoners was a concern from a very narrow class and social position, whereas its agenda was about creating uh, productive populations at the marginal and stigmatized fringes of society. Now, the uh, resolution was accepted in February 1914, but the jail committee was ultimately appointed only in April 1919 in a context which I have referred to already. And it was one of the blueprints for post-war economic, social and political reconstruction by which the colonial state wanted to reorder its the grounds for its legitimacy, for, uh, sorry, it was one of the ways in which the colonial state wanted to reorder uh, the terms of imperial legitimacy in India. Now, the Indian Jail Committee had an interface with other blueprints for post-war reconstruction. Soon after it was appointed, it was asked also to engage with a few paragraphs in the Indian Industrial Committee report of 1916 to 18, which dealt with jail industries. Now, these were just a few paragraphs which said that the extensive use of machinery in jails was undesirable, jail labor should be kept to manual labor, and that too on industries which did not undercut, which didn't, would not undercut cottage industry. Now, the major plank of the Indian Jail Committee, and I'm going to focus on that rather than some other issues which it took up, was the Jail Committee set out to show that improving the productivity of captive labor would not undermine industrialization in, in India. In fact, it would work to the benefit of a nation on the verge of industrialization and the taxpayer. Now, at a more subtle level and barely detectable, it was also carrying on a dialogue with agendas for social reconstruction which had come suddenly to the surface from 1917 when Montague in Parliament promised that a discussion was being inaugurated which would put India on the path towards responsible government. Now, this actually led to a hectic proliferation of associations and it gave a real boost to political life in India. You had new platforms emerging for the depressed classes and labor. And as I pointed out, this polyvocality challenged the Congress claim to speak for the nation. Now, what the jail committee therefore did was that it said that it was it was going it was encouraging Indians to take an interest in civic issues instead of only political issues. It said that respectable Indians sort of did not uh, focused on politics to the exclusion of agendas for social reconstruction. So, in a sense, the colonial state was speaking to these new publics and saying that it was concerned about. Uh, marginal, about uh, marginal and stigmatized elements and that it would guide respectable Indians by becoming prison visitors, by looking after release, setting up released prisoner society, etc., societies, etc., by sitting on advisory boards, etc. It would encourage respectable Indians to take an interest in the uplift both of prison populations, juvenile delinquents, and criminal 
uh, communities. Finally, there was a very down-to-earth reason for setting up the Indian Jail Committee and we must not forget that a very substantial proportion of the report is not about ideological base, though it did link itself to these, which is about the reconstruction of the jail service. After the war, the jail uh, services, that is the warders and the warder establishment was in a very ramshackle state because of wartime inflation, jails were overcrowded with people who had come in for petty theft. Uh, in addition, European superintendents had been deputed for war service. Indian jail warders, there was a high turnover because pay was very bad and service conditions were very bad. As a result, there was a greater reliance upon warders and labor overseers recruited from the prisoners themselves. And this was a very heavily critiqued uh, feature of the Indian jail regime. So the committee had to argue that penal reform by reducing jail numbers, improving labor productivity and preventing recidivism, that is the return of offenders again and again to jail, would reduce costs. Now let's talk about its study tour. So its first meeting was in London. It visited uh, prisons, hostels, that is juvenile reformatories and children's courts. Now interestingly, in England also, a non-official inquiry was going on into prison conditions. Government had refused an inquiry, but the context was somewhat similar to India in that during it was the incarceration of political prisoners, that is suffragettes, conscientious objectors, those who did not want to fight in the war, and so-called pro-Bolshevik agitators, they had been kept in prison during the war period and this inquiry was oriented to the dilemmas which they had faced. Now after England, passage to the continent was blocked by a railway strike, so the jail committee went to, the, uh, uh, to America. The news about India in America at that point was very dire, but here and there in American newspapers you do find small entries about the Indian Jail Committee report. For example, they were very intrigued that there was a real Raja in the party and that too one who was a barrister and who wanted to see the World Series of football games or basketball games. Uh, they were all, American papers were also uh, kind of uh, said that, you know, it was great that, you know, a, a sort of imperial delegation found American penal, uh, penal um, experiments interesting enough to send a high-powered committee from India. And this is uh, a picture, this is their itinerary, uh, this, is the this is their global tour. Okay. So from America, they came across the Pacific, saw some two prisons in Japan. Then they went to the American colony of the Philippines. And they went to the huge prison uh, there in Manila called the Bilibid prison, which had become a regular tourist feature. That is all st uh, steamers which stopped at Manila, the tourists would go and visit this Bilibid prison. And finally, they visited a prison in Hong Kong and came back to India where they toured uh, uh, all the provinces. They toured jails, reformatories and criminal tribe settlements with the exception of Assam. And they also went to the penal settlement in the Andaman Islands. I think I have to cut down now my talk. Now, interestingly, the word criminology occurs only twice. Penology occurs 50 times. And one index of this is an entire chapter and an appendix on the indeterminate sentence. Now, the committee said that indeterminate sentence only meant a more elastic sentence, which is that the sentence could be uh, cut down a bit. You could have a minimum sentence and a maximum sentence. And between the minimum sentence and the maximum sentence, there would be scope to either let the prisoner off after he had finished the minimum sentence or he would be made to serve his full sentence. Now this is interesting because in fact in England uh, you had an act called the Prevention of Crimes Act which was based upon this principle. It was meant for habitual offenders and if a person committed a crime more than any crime more than three times they could be sentenced, they would first serve a fixed death sentence and then they would have to go on staying under more relaxed conditions of confinement, but their sentence could be extended till they showed signs of reform. 
The judges in England were always uneasy about this new act which had been passed and its use was in fact declining in the United Kingdom. Now I'm going to focus on the chapter on indeterminate sentencing uh, where it began with the critique of the high numbers of prisoners in jails and the argument was that this high number was uh, a great expense, a great loss to the state, not only because of the cost of maintaining such a large number, but, in, but due to the fact that such a large mass had been withdrawn from the producing ranks of the community. And the argument was that long detention would render them less and less able to occupy a useful place in the world. Now, the Indian Jail Committee took a very optimistic view on reformability. They said the very backwardness of India, the lack of industrialization meant a smaller recidivist, that is habitual offender element. It did not dwell on the darker argument, that is longer sentences for those who were considered dangerous and the irreclaimable. But interestingly, whereas it, rec uh, it advocated the abolition of transportation, it said that the Andamans should still be preserved for those offenders whom the government in the public interest felt should be removed from the mainland and still kept in the Andamans. So they, they still wanted to keep the Andamans for those whom the government simply felt had to continue to be incarcerated under this vague formulation in the public interest. Now what is interesting is that this idea of, uh, ref of, of penal reform fit in very well with schemes for making prison, uh, prison labor more uh, productive. Because what they recommended was the concentration of prisoners in large central jails. Now, if you had short-term sentences, the prisoners were kept to district jails where due to limitations of space and of money, they were basically kept to manual work. So the prison committee said that for the introduction of power machinery, expert supervision, etc. You had to concentrate this workforce there. Here in these larger prisons, you could be allowed <coughs> incentives to stimulate good conduct and industry, such as relaxations of discipline, a small gratuity and advisory boards to consider remission. Now what had happened was that they also pointed out that this would result in better discipline. Now the violence with which work was enforced had become an embarrassment so too the extensive use of convict overseers and warders. Now beyond that, uh, you also had the two medical men, the men from the Indian Medical Service, Bukhanan and Jackson, who also wanted the exclusion, who, who also wanted the exclusion of the mentally defective from the ranks of prisoners on the ground that their presence would compromise reform and they wanted the definition of the 1913 British Mental Deficiency Act to be, implied, to be applied. Now the committee rejected this, they said it was too advanced a position for India and they said it would complicate the issue of criminal responsibility. That is too many people would be claiming a lesser sentence or a different kind of confinement on the basis that they were not uh, they, came under one of these categories of mental deficiency. And here, these two medical men pay tribute to a very famous American penologist, Catherine Baymond Davis, who was part of the, of the progressive movement in America for penal reform. What the committee disapproved was prisoners just being released as a kind of political boon. There was a very secret and bitter controversy about uh, the 19, about a proclamation in uh, 1919 which had granted clemency to a lot of political offenders. So a lot of officials were upset about this and they said if you're letting prisoners off, they have to be, they have to have earned this remission. It should not be given like a kind of political boom. Now basically what is very interesting is, and this is where the committee really invested a lot of time and effort, is they wanted to change the meaning of the term hard labor which was associated with rigorous imprisonment. They said that hard labor only meant 
that the prisoner should work hard at whatever work was given to him. It did not mean severe physical exertion. Prisoners who made who were made productive were prisoners who were reformed and could be let off earlier. But this investment in machines, in introducing machines into jails, had an element of industrial futurism about it. In other words, placing the prisoner against a machine was supposed to automatically transfer him into a productive and therefore reformed being. If the object of hard labor was to reform the offender, then the form of labor had to excite his interest, lead him to exert his powers willingly, and so enable him to form habits of industry. So what we have here is a kind of design for kind of simulating. That is kind of creating a kind of, um, by simulation I mean a kind of synthetic context in which conditions of production at sites of captive labor can sort of uh, mimic or imitate conditions of free labor. Thereby jails and other sites of confinement like juvenile reformatories and criminal tribe settlements were being recast, not as spaces where uh, labor would undercut industrialization based on free labor, but as work sites which were participant in an industrial future for India. I have to now skip a lot because I'm running short of time. Now obviously there were limits to change and we see that even today. Even today the chakki, that is jail jaoge chakki pisoge, this lingers on in the public imagination as that technology whose very primitivity ensures that what is extracted with every turn of the handle is well deserved retribution. For example you have one um, uh, I, I'll go to that quotation later. Now, was purely manual labor deadening and degrading? Was it degrading for everybody or was it only degrading for some? So, on the one hand, I have an image from the museum in the Andaman Islands which shows a political prisoner turning uh, oil press. On the other hand, I have a picture of the common mass of prisoners in Rangoon jail uh, uh, in Burma who are fettered to a treadmill and pushing the treadmill. Here is the, uh, here is the image to that picture which I showed you, Kolu. Kolu was the most difficult and hardest work which caused the death of some, insanity of a few and general strikes of political prisoners in the cellular jail. The political prisoners were yoked to the handle and they moved around it continuously. If they were unwilling or unable to move round force, they were forcibly tied to the handle and dragged round and round the ground. Some political prisoners uh, were actually able to make poetry out of their stint at the Chakki, who had Maulana Hasrat Mohani. I don't know Udu very well, so I'll just go with the English translation. He said, Hasrat is continuing to compose verses side by side with the grinding of wheat. What a peculiar nature does Hasrat possess? By the way, this Maulana Hasrat Mahani was the person who coined the phrase Inkilab Zindabad, later popularized by Bhagat Singh. So in other words, by treating the political prisoner as an, anon an, as an anomalous element in jail, someone who did not belong there, Complaints about treatment could be addressed or dismissed as emanating from a class position. This meant that a universal human standard of dignity did not emerge. Now, the argument was that these manual forms were appropriate for the short-term coolie class prisoners, something like grinding grain or uh, pressing oil. The task was easy to set. It could be stepped up for indiscipline. It was pointed out that hand ground grain and hand pressed oil supplied pure items and that there was a market for them. In addition, the emphasis in jails very often was on self-sufficiency. That is, you should not 
pay for any form of labor or service if you can get it from the prisoners themselves so it was the reproduction of the jail which was the primary concern rather than the productivity of jail labor and even for australia it has been pointed out that that in contrast to the idea that convict labor was regarded as productive human capital to be used rationally recently there's been a revision of revisionism and two historians have said that productivity was subordinated to reproductive work and to discipline and punch now i won't go into women prisoners but female prisoners for example were kept to grinding chakki because it was supposed to be domestic type work by the way they did this work not only did this work actually for payment the prison was paid for this work done by women and even in free life women were paid by merchants etc for grinding and processing grain and currently by the way i discovered that there's a nostalgia for the domestic hand mill women are you know there uh, there's a sort of uh, nostalgic evocation of the folk songs women are supposed to sing it advocated as uh, something you do which uh, uh, it says that in the past women used to use it to lessen the pain of childbirth and currently it's been sold for domestic use and women are told that they can do this instead of going spending a lot of money going to fitness uh, fitness uh, saloons they could kind of grind um, atta and dal at home this is a, a quotation from one chief minister of uh, maharashtra who in 2014 told his political adversary that he would soon find himself in jail chakki piecing 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 that is forced relentlessly to turn a stone hand mill and this is despite the fact that the chakki has long been replaced in indian jails by the power driven long uh, by the power driven mill now what happened in jails as a, uh, after this was the continuation of fettered labor what you had was a lot of jail labor was not kept in secure jails it was kept in camp jails which were very insecure and therefore iron on the body compensated for the lack of uh, walls for the lack of masonry which meant that you had leg fetters at work and you had the bail chain the linked chain at night and the indian jail committee itself accepted fettering to the wall as a punishment seeing it as an acceptable substitute for flogging i now wind up in 5 minutes i've taken a little longer than i should have by pointing out that the true location for the success of international penology actually was found in the criminal tribe settlement now this was because the indian jail committee rep- recommended a stage wide stage wise system for criminal tribe settlements it said that for those who were the most incorrigible the most irreformable you should have a more rigid penal type criminal uh, tribe settlement that was somewhere between a jail and a normal settlement for the other reformable element you would have a more relaxed criminal tribe settlement and those who were incorrigible could be returned to this normal settlement if they improved themselves they also pointed out that there had to be the possibility of an end point that is you had to set out the circumstances under which a final release from any settlement could be obtained now here's a picture of a class in carpentry for the colored children by uh, the photograph is from the american madurai mission in south india so here you can see that uh, the propaganda value of this photograph is that these children are being trained to useful to a useful craft in other words this is one of the shifts which is confirmed by the 20s and 30s that is the criminal tribe settlement once described as the exotic outgrowth of a caste based oriental criminology began to be hailed as the one successful example of the introduction of a probationary regime settlements which achieved a more relaxed regime were hailed as voluntary settlements and became the model model for the idea of a settled labor colony such settlements began to be seen as a model for other problematic populations such as beggars 
and unstable municipal workers, in particularly conservancy workers, that is sweepers, etc., who were both drawn sometimes from so-called untouchable castes as well as sometimes from those categorized as so-called criminal tribes. In other words, what you have is a kind of interface which began to build up between penology and social welfare. You can see this in the career, for example, of one Bombay official called OHB Star, who built up a reputation, who became a criminal tribes officer and then built up a reputation as an expert in the newly emerging field of social work. His work as a criminal tribe settlement officer received a lot of publicity. So in 1925, he was asked to present a scheme for a beggar settlement. In 1929, he was appointed chairman of the depressed classes and aboriginal committee. The next year as backward classes officer for the Bombay presidency. And in 1932, the designation criminal tribe settlement officer was changed to the backward class officer. In other words, the backward class officer was now supposed to look after criminal tribes as part of his agenda for looking after other backward classes as well. So I conclude by saying that criminology, David Garland has pointed out that the science of criminology offered social engineering possibilities which classical jurisprudence did not. Because classical jurisprudence only focused on uniform and calculable punishment for every criminal act. On the other hand, a sociological approach to the causes of crime gave reformist elites and governments a scientific rationale for authoritarian interventions to reshape forms of existence. This is what the historian uh, uh, Carlos Aguirre has noted for the career of criminology in Peru and I think it applies uh, to India as well. So Indian educated publics responded positively to the social engineering possibilities of criminology and so-called scientific penology. Authoritarian but benevolent tutelage could be exercised over backward classes through the police, the education department, the labor department and the backward classes department. And as provincial ministries became had a larger Indian element in it, they were the ones who were in, in control of these departments. Now this, uh, uh, this work would be assisted by philanthropic social workers. And the result was, the hope was that shiftless, disorderly and sometimes ritually stigmatized lower orders would thereby be shaped into orderly political constituencies and disciplined labor forces. But what these Indian educated publics demanded for themselves were not, was not this. What they demanded for themselves were the classical legal principles of due process of the law buttressed by judicial autonomy and the curtailment of executive discretion. So I'll stop here. Just wanted to show you that this was a kind of ticket which the, with the uh, number, the crime, etc., which the prisoners had to wear around their neck. Here's a picture of the prisoners pushing up uh, water, uh, uh, kind of, uh, they're sort of raising water from the well by pushing at it by hand. So that's all then. I'll switch off my stop presenting. So, uh, I, I apologize to the presenters for overrunning my time a bit. Thank you, Thank you so much, ma'am, for this very interesting, enthusiastic, and thought provoking talk. And uh, now we would like to open the floor for questions. You can choose to unmute and put forward your questions or write them in the chat box for us to take them up on your behalf. ask a question. Uh, I had a question. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it's not very related to the daily code, but I was wondering, so there's this difference between um, reformable and irreformable uh, prisoners. So how is the treatment towards, method towards them different apart from the duration uh, of imprisonment uh, accorded to them? What was the, were there other differences? Uh,